Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, welcome to Think Tech. I'm Crystal, and I usually have my show on Quok Talk, but today is a special day on behalf of Outreach College at UH Manoa. UH Presents is providing a very fun and cultural storytelling performance tonight. So I'm going to introduce our wonderful guest who's going to tell lots and lots of stories, I hope, so we'll learn everything we need to learn about Ireland. At this point, let me introduce my lovely guest, all the way from Ireland, Neil DeBerka. Welcome, Neil. Aloha. It's great to be here, Crystal. You're supposed to answer in, like, Gaelic or something, right? Well, do you wish. It's Mr. Neil DeBerka. It's a great Merci. Perfect. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> that means my name is Neil DeBerka. I'm from Galway. I live in Dublin. Aloha. It is mighty to be here. So you're just a scaly from Gael, what's, what's the town you, Gael, Gael, Galway? From Galway, the west of Ireland, on the wild Atlantic way. You got that right, scaly, you said. Yeah? Scaly. I was once called a squally, but it's a scaly, and that yeah. means, it's a simply a simple translation, it means storyteller. Uh, there's another word for it too, shanachy, but I have another 20 years before I get that. Okay, so we're talking ancient, ancient times, as your stories do kind of develop their, the inspiration from. Now, let's talk about the storytelling. You know, I told my daughter, in fact, I was driving her to rehearsal earlier, and I said, I'm going to be interviewing a storyteller. Um, she says, that's what he does, what, that's his job. And people think, wow, what kind of a person has a job as a storyteller? I'm a very lucky man. Voila. I saw an old man on the stage when I was a kid and I thought, that's me. And I'm very lucky in that my parents, if you met my parents, you'd know why I do, why I do, and my aunties. And so I, uh, many people would be aware that Ireland is a very oral culture. It's a very oral culture. And uh, me, I'm just very lucky. I get to tell my stories around Ireland and other places too. So what I do is I tell my story, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. Hmm. It might be in Galway one day. I actually live in Dublin. Like many Irish, I emigrated quite young, and then when I came back, I'm based in Dublin. It's uh, because of the travel. Mm -hmm. But I get home to go away a lot. Uh, but one day, you could be in Belfast, you could be down in Cork, you could be in, in the north side of Cork City, or you could be in the rural glens of Antrim up the very north. Uh, many viewers might be familiar of that area because it's on Game of Thrones. A lot of it's uh, filmed there. Or I could be in Wicklow. You might have heard the TV series The Vikings. Yes. Arr. A lot of it's Do you watch that? <laughs> How authentic is it compared to what you think? Um, well, it's, uh, we could spend a whole program talking about <laughs> that. But the fact is, is that uh, the Vikings are a very real part of uh, the history and tradition of Ireland. In Ireland, it's very fascinating. Um, you can tell someone's ancestry by their name. Okay. So, for instance, if someone had a name like Cotter or Sorensen, uh, you'd know that it would have a Viking ancestor, or indeed my own name. It's very funny when I come to North America. People say, that can't be an Irish name. And sometimes I think I should call myself Patrick O'Reilly or something. Have you ever done the uh, Ancestry.com or whatever you call that, 23? No, I haven't, but it would be interesting to find out. But uh, you can tell somebody's um, uh, paternal ancestor by their uh, surname in Ireland. So my name, de Burka, is simply, it's a Norman surname. Okay. That's Gaelicized. Uh, so the Normans came and you'd have names like Gibbons and Dillon and Butler and uh, Fitzgerald, these will be names that are very Irish names, and Burke, uh, Jennings, uh, but throughout they will history, have a Norman they ancestor. But kind of, uh, transform throughout history? They do. And the, my name originally would have been de Burgo or de Burg, okay. and then in 1333 the family then took Irish law, took Irish traditions, and, and now it's de Burka in, in, in Irish. So, but sorry, going back to your storytelling, is you, you choose to tell uh, traditional stories, stories from ancient legends of, you know, things that we don't know about. And why? Why do you choose? Why is it so important to talk about traditions and sharing them by storytelling? For me, storytelling is very simple. It's share the joy, honor the ancestors. And we've got all this corpus of ancient myth and legend. Mm -hmm. It needs to be told. It needs to be performed live. And for me, live performance is very, very important. To sit down and share those ancient myths so long ago or a medieval legend stories of warriors or stories of strong women, stories of how the landscape was formed, stories of the goddesses and gods. That's like the poet holding up the mirror. It's the storyteller just holding up the history of the landscape of us as a people and of all peoples. Because yeah. the stories are the same no matter where you go. I've heard stories here in Avahi and you could be listening to an Irish hero myth. I've heard stories in Japan and you could be, it could be an Irish, you could be sitting in an Irish home listening to a ghost story. They're the same wherever you go, because people's dreams, their fears and desires 
they're the same because we're all the same. But the regional differences, how the the dreams and the desires and the, and, and, the, and the fears of a people's imagination or the sense of wonder, they just dress up differently to fit the tradition in which that story is. But sets. do you think that the dreams and imaginations of the younger generation now, particularly who are so consumed and obsessed with social media and technology, that they lose that concept of that live performance, the beauty of, of telling a story in person, on stage, and seeing that acted out, these goddesses and big stories of warriors? This is the bit where I slap the table. Young people are the best. They're great. The teenage audience are the best. People say, oh, the people say teenagers can't listen. All what we have to do is present, bring it up there. They love live performances, and they're the greatest uh, audience because they'll, um, if they like it, they'll go, that was great. And they're really loyal. And if you suck, they'll tell you. Yeah, you they'll be rolling your eyes. Yeah, they're selfies. great. So it's it's up to us as artists and performers to to bring it to bring that live performance to get out there and grist to the mill, show the stories, per perform the stories, and create new ones too. So have you had an experience where you had such a challenging audience that they're just giving you the kind of thumbs down or just? didn't care to listen? Or how do you engage them and bring them in and say, hey? It was my job as a performer. That's what I'm there to do. And I love to do it. And I think if you love to do something, people respond to it. And I've been doing this for quite a while now. And I always say that the, uh, it's, it, it's the, it, the parliament of the fireside, the family fireside, the university of the fireside, where the tales you hear growing up, and you bring them out there and you perform them, people respond to that. And, you know, someone might be, people are they're into their video games, they're into watching Netflix or whatever. But you can't beat sitting down with a live performance and you look into Sometimes you can step out of the story and you can just look in, you can see mm. the audience, and you know they're taken to the other place. And that's what the art's about. That's what our ancestors did. That's when they did the cave paintings. They were telling stories, they were educating. And that's why it's an honor to be here as part of the cultural outreach program for the university, mm. because the university is committed to bringing live arts to right. the islands. And I feel really privileged. Yeah. that I've been invited to do this. And then I'm sitting here on Honolulu in November with the sun shining outside. Yes. <laughs> and so I and you've think... you've been island hopping for all your different workshops and presentations and performances. I was in Oahu yesterday and... Um, no, this day is Oahu. I was, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it took two days to get here. My head was falling off. We were jet lagged. Where did you go? <laughs> I, um, we think we got uh, the guy. We left New York. We flew from, uh, I flew from Dublin to New York and, I, and my cousin was meeting me there at okay. the airport and uh, had dinner, and then I drove across Manhattan okay. with a Bulgarian fellow in the car with Uber. Oh. I had a great fun through the traffic, and then on to the next aeroplane, and we're only an hour in the air, and he says, slight issue with the engine. No. <laughs> so we stopped in LA and oh. had to change planes. So it took two days to get here. Okay. But the point is, I'm here, and I'm loving it. And I was first in a while with my eyes swimming in my head going, fado, fado, which is Irish for long, long ago, and far, far away. But you know what? There was a bunch of young people looking up, and I locked into it, and I loved it. And then after that, I was on Big Island, yeah. and I was in Waimea, wow. and I did, uh, I did a show in the Kahului Theatre there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic state-of-the-art theatre. Yes. And uh, I just rolled into town, and I got a great welcome. The audience were great fun. Loved it. We did an outreach the next day with young people down by the sea. There was a kupuna, kupuna, um, uh, an elder. Okay. I, hope I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing kupuna. that right. Kapuna, yeah. and uh, she, I, I told stories uh -huh. of the sea linking the two cultures, Polynesia and Ireland. Mm -hmm. And then the Kupuna mm -hmm. uh, took the, the fledglings down by the edge of the sea, and the waves were crashing in, and she talked about how the land, how this is where salt was made, how her oh, grandfather beautiful. came to get the salt, and talked about the importance of the environment and how things are always changing and how we live within that change. So in a way, you're inspired by the Hawaiian culture and their ancient stories, and you use that in kind of the inspiration. I was, I was humbled. Yeah? I was humbled uh, to, to be able to be a part of that. And I turned around and I, I saw Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. Mauna Kea, yeah. And Mauna Loa. Wow. And then I saw in the middle, uh, uh, the elder, she talked about how there was a hillock in the middle, and it was made of pure obsidian. Oh. That's well, great for slaying dragons. Oh. <laughs> so let's talk about dragons. <laughs> what is the story of dragons in Ireland? No, dragons aren't really an Irish thing. Well, you know, there's... Okay, the Loch Ness Monster, no? Well, you got the wrong country. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I got the green back. But the Scots right? are our cousins. Yeah, it's across the way. I have a cousin living in Loch Lomond. But no, that's... Uh, that's um, the myth of a monster within Loch Ness. Okay, but within sorry. our own tradition, I'll but tell you no about... But dragons. I'll tell you, well, you know, there is, of course, you'll, like over on the... If you ever go to the Wild, if you go to the Wild Atlantic Way, 
don't forget. Everybody, here, let me give you a couple of examples. Okay, please. If you go to the west of Ireland and you cross from Galway or County Clare to the Aran Islands, okay. uh, you'll go to a place called Pol na Pest, which is uh, the serpent's lair, oh, according so to the marketeers. But it's, uh, so, so it's this wonderful rectangle rectangular, cut by the ocean, cut by nature, like a giant swimming pool at the okay. bottom of the base of a cliff. All right. It's filled with the ocean surging in and out. So there's be stories about that. The story of the great river Shannon, which is our greatest river, there was a mighty serpent who dwelt where now the river, where the beginning of the river was, but he dwelt there and he killed many. But there was oh. a druid living on the far Aran Islands, and that druid, Gowning, he went and he told that serpent you better get out of there. It's a long story. We haven't got time. We've only 20 minutes. Are you going to tell that one tonight? Uh, no, actually. Oh, okay. So that's okay to share it here. <laughs> <laughs> you have to come again. You have to come again. You have to have a performance tonight. If you happen to be here in Oahu, it's tonight. But I'll tell you again later. But so stories. Um, so, uh, what but just to finish on that point, okay, I'm sorry, sorry to cut see? across <laughs> it. But it, the story comes where the serpent tried to yes. escape. And he gouged out the landscape in fleeing. And then the rain, because it rains a bit in Ireland, filled it up. So you, there you have the River Shannon. So the landscape is, is full of stories. Every field has a story. Every river has a story, and we have uh, the story of the Khaylach, which is the, the ancient what? the Khaylach, which is the representative of the the feminine ancestress, Ooh, like the that. goddess, and she's casting the stones around the landscape. She's forming it. Ah. So that is at the heart of the ancient culture within the And it the is land very too. similar to the Hawaiian culture when you think about how the mountains were made and the goddess created the. You know, it's really quite interesting the parallels that different ancient cultures have like you said that's why there is that human connection with all the different places the maui yeah we have uh, you, you know you'd have your demigod maui we would have uh, we have a Ooh. mighty hero called fion makul or as he's known in, in some dialects finn makul what is the goddess god of well, no, Fionn isn't a god himself, but he represents all of us as we go through our life. There's different stories about him. Okay. And represent uh, Fionn as a child, Fionn as a young man, and then Fionn as he's growing old, his hair is graying, and he sees the other um, young warriors coming through. So it's fascinating. But you have uh, who is uh, who would have um, some godly ancestry, and uh -huh. you have the ancient gods like Bridget, uh -huh. who's goddess of healing, goddess of fire, nice. goddess of the arts, of Jean Kecht, of medicine, Lu, the sun god. And Uchi Olahar, the great all-knowing one. And, so, and then the Morrigan, who would be the goddess of war. So, and then you have the stories, so you have the stories of mythology, stories of landscape, stories of kings and queens and warriors, stories of saints and sinners, and then the stories of the people, uh, the stories of the history of the country. But then you have to make up new stories too, because the figure has to come up with new tunes. There's so many. So when you travel and when you see new things, you incorporate your new st contemporary stories into the ancient stories, or are you inspired by the ancient stories and you see how that applies to contemporary stories? My job is to fit the audience. So what I do is I stay true to the original tale, but I dance with it. But I keep the heart of the story as it was. So that way you're showing respect to the tradition, mm. but you can dance within that. So if I'm with a bunch of teenagers here in Honolulu yeah. or on the Big Island, or if I'm in Maui, then what I do is I, I, I need to make it relevant to them. Right. So I'll change my language and delivery and throw in elements of 21st century life in that. And then if I'm with a bunch of elders, likewise, I'll change my energy. You can see I'm quite physical in the way I would perform. And, uh, so how do you perform for the kapunas? How do you do I, that? I bring the energy down a bit. And also you Why? change our voices. Maybe they the want that high energy. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, want them. they want you to rock the boat a little bit. <laughs> Indeed. So you, you kind of dance with that. You dance yeah. with the audience. So there's the five ages. There's the, the little ones, the babies, the yes. early childhood. Then there's children, teens and young adults. And then you have the elders. It's interesting that you say that the teenagers the are the most uh, interesting the, the the better audience for you because they they challenge you in a way I saw YouTube clips of you uh, performing in front of young kids and they are just like over their heads in you know in awe and, and it's really wonderful to see so we're gonna take a quick break um, if you don't know who Neil de Burke is during the quick break time go YouTube or check out his information because he's a wonderful storyteller but you know what forget it forget I said that because he doesn't like social media you come back here and we'll tell you more about the ancient tales because there's nothing that replaces the beauty of storytelling and oral tradition so don't go away Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, 
your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, we're back here talking story and of the life and beauty of storytelling, uh, Irish storytelling. Um, with Neil DeVerka, who's here to perform tonight at the um, Orvis Auditorium at UH Manoa. So if you happen to be watching this and you have enough time, you check out your calendar and you're free tonight at 7.30, go check it out because as Neil says, there's nothing like live performance. And I'm intrigued because a lot of people think, what does it mean to be a storyteller a performing storyteller. I mean, you can tell stories over dinner, you know, you read storybooks to kids when they go to bed, but what does it mean and what does it distinguish you to be a performing storyteller, a professional storyteller? Well, Traditional like, one at that. <laughs> and Irish. <laughs> well, you'd have, the, you'd have the stories growing up, so you have their DNA in you, but also the ones that, uh, that I create okay. are ones that like, sometimes I'm asked to present particular stories. Uh, so what you do is you have to spend a lot of time it's like a guitarist. There's a lot of stuff that goes into them being on the stage. Sure. There's a lot of time spent. Like I'm here, I'm absorbing stuff the whole time. You and got some vibes I'm processing going. it. Yeah. And I've a couple of stories I tell from my experiences in Hawaii. So what happens is you go away and you, you, you think it through and then it starts to bubble up. And the bubbling up happens when you're relaxed and then a little bit of inspiration comes. Then you can pop it in somewhere. Then you work on it, tinkering away like a blacksmith. But you need then to be open this, oh, you have to be, for yeah. something to... Yeah, and that's the nature of it. And I think it's similar with any artist, any art form. Yeah. You have to open yourself up, you have to give time for that. And a lot of the storytelling, a lot of the stuff I deal with with the young people, and also with children, and grow, with all ages, just take the time. We're all in an age of distraction. What yes. better thing than just to do nothing for a while and let yourself open up, and therein lieth the muse. Then the muse shows herself, yeah. and then you can start to dance. And there's nothing better than the joy. I talked about the stuff that goes into getting onto the stage, but when you're on the stage and you just, like tonight, I'm here, thanks for coming, let's go. And we go to another place. Yes. We go to where the ancestors are, or we talk about, uh, I'll throw in a new one that I'm rocking in for the fun. And people, you know, live performance is great. I love going to live performance myself. Yeah. And any time I go out on stage, I just think about the people who stand. Anybody who's ever performed before, they're at my shoulder. Mm. So if you ever have to get up and speak in public, remember, you're not on your own. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Shavo, is that but it's not Shavo, just public um, speaking. For you, it's, it's transporting people. The art of transporting people back into another time is, is, is something beautiful about that. Um, let's transport back into your childhood. Why, what kind of created this language for you and this kind of world that you needed to share with the rest of the world growing up? Well, if you look at the chair with the four, um, the four chair that props it up, the legs of a chair, mm -hmm. my four legs would be my father's from a place called County Mayo. And I spent a lot of time there as a kid in that landscape with my aunties and cousins, and I, I'm very lucky to have a father who told stories the whole time. And my mother is from a place called County Meath. She was raised in the, uh, near, the bank, um, near the banks of the River Boyne, which is named after an old goddess. Okay. And if you flow down the Boyne from their cottage, you will come to a place called Bruna Boyne, which is the mythological heart of the country. Oh, um, wow. And in that part of the country, the, it, North Leinster, they have a wonderful way of being, a great way of talking, mm. and a wonderful way of telling yarns. I also um, have the city of Galway. I'm very lucky that... Um, I heard they're famous for oysters there. Yep, and <laughs> if you go to the Galway market of a Saturday and look up Mickey Brown, Mikey Brown, he does the best oysters you in the whole of Ireland. You just eat them raw? Just chuck them? Yep, he'll shuck them for you, and yeah. they're the most beautiful oysters you'll ever get. What do you want Michael Brown with? in the Galway market of a Saturday. Okay. Sometimes Tony Walsh is there helping him. Okay. And also, uh, also we spent some time in Clare as a child. And now, along Ireland's wild Atlantic way, are three of those counties, Clare, Galway, and Mayo. And it's a very, the landscape is where the sea meets the land. And where, 
you know, the stories of history have played out. We so like you're thinking surrounded the by the beauty of nature and, and like mother, mother Earth and mountains and water and everything. And city too. Galway was like an old medieval okay. city. But any Irish town. There was a great Irish storyteller called Brian McMahon from a place called Listowel in Kerry where they have a beautiful dialect and they have a beautiful way of, of, of they're proud of their traditional mm. arts. He said he never had to leave Listowel to see the world. That the world is in every small town. Mm -hmm. And your own great American, Joseph Campbell, mm -hmm. great Irish American, Joseph Campbell said, you know, within the little tiniest drop of water, you mm -hmm. get the whole thing of that. You get the whole thing of life and the universe, the drama play of universe. As Shakespeare well, said, the of, whole world's a stage. Pardon me. I was just going to say, speaking of drama, just I'm just imagining you as a little kid. Were you like doing sword fighting? Were you playing with your uh, siblings or peers uh, with all these kind of imaginary things that people lose now? The kids now just lack imagination because everything's just poured onto their plate. Well, that's our responsibility now as adults. But I think kids have the imagination. We just have to ch -ch get in. So how do you ch -ch now? By without... doing it. The person who's telling the story to the kids tonight is the best storyteller in the world. The ma or pa, brother or sister, or granny or granda who's reading a book or telling the story to the little ones. That's what it's all about. You just do it. Yeah. And the kids will respond. And now I know teachers are telling me, teachers come to my workshops and they're saying that little ones are presenting, you know, with the flick, 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 yeah. with the iPad thing. Yeah. Some teachers have told me that kids are, the concept of play is no longer there. It's, it's kids there. have it there. Just get in there and tell the stories and play. Get dirty, take the shoes and socks off and get out yes. of the dirt and live. And fall off the tree and get stung by nettles. Yeah. Get up and go have experiences. So it's very straightforward. And I love the stories of the ancestors, but the new stories too are important because our little ones growing up, their mythology is created now. Mm. So it's important to create the new stories to perform. I, yesterday I was with some men uh, telling stories um, west of Honolulu. Okay. And uh, I told a tale that happened to me down in Waianae. You know Waianae? Yeah. And, uh, and I was really enjoying it because the lads, the boys were leaning So they were like really local. Yeah, and, uh, and Ala Moana and throwing stuff in. And, okay. And I, so it reiterated to me that live performance is all about in that moment mm. and shared experience. It's like our ancestors sitting around the campfire or sitting around the mm. fire and just it, that's what it is. It's shared experience, be it music, be it drama. Yeah. And you know, um, indigenous kind of um, storytelling is, is, you know, the whole point of it is, is, like you said, the oral tradition. There are ways to pass knowledge down that Western concepts seem to lack in a way. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and Indeed. the importance of why oral tradition is so effective? I see it the whole time. You can drop in a lesson about bullying in the middle of a, an old ancient Kukulun or Fionn McCool story. Drop in a, a thing about a practical life skill, how to protect yourself in the ocean. These are all there. It's all been done for us. It's yeah. all there. I'll give you another example. I was in Mumbai. Mumbai, oh. wow. I was in Mumbai, city full of energy yes. in India. A lady called Jagruti came up. She said, Neil, I think this story you like. Take it back to Ireland. It's in a book. I said, Jagruti, will you tell me the story? She said, but what if I leave bits out? I said, tell me the story. So we sat down, her friend, and she told me this story. Ancient myth from India mm. about the Devas and Asuras. A week later, I'm back in a place called Dunleary in South Dublin. I'm with a bunch of young people and I thought I'd tell the tale and I jumped to tell the tale. Two minutes into the story, I looked at these ones looking up at me. They were like that. And I thought, that's it. That's the power of myth. It is. Simple, easy as. Everyone has it. Yeah. And there's this ancient tale of India, that mighty ancient culture with a bunch of city Irish kids locked in, 21st century style. Yeah, share the joy, honor the ancestors. A good word never broke a tooth. Okay, let's talk about that. I was going to ask you that, and you stole my thunder. What is a good word never broke a tooth? It means this, that if you greet the world with a smile on your face and away you go, the world stands back and makes a path for those who know where to they wish to go. In other words, if you get to know, tell you, get out there with a smile on your face. Try and stand in other people's shoes. Do you remember that great American writer, Harper Lee? Mm-hmm. Uh, in her book, To Kill a Mockingbird. Of course. Atticus Finch, he says to Scout. Oh, yeah. He says to Scout, you know, Scout, you put yourself in another person's shoes, mm, get the right. perspective. Right. And that's what stories have been doing since the get go. Right. Since their first storytelling session, which was in a cave around a fire, with cave paintings on the wall all around, someone jumped up and told a tale about an experience. 
everybody got to sit and to stand in another person's shoes. So that's what it is. Mm. Um, and that's why I think the program, the, the cultural extension program, is so important. Yes. It brings live performance right throughout the islands. Schools are to libraries, to theatres, to spaces both indoor and outdoor. That's good stuff. That's grist to the mill. That builds glue. It builds community. Mm. So thanks very much to the university for having me over. I and really you're also going it. continuing. You have here, you have a couple of workshops here to do, and then you're going to another island. You want to tell us a little bit about that part I'm, of your journey? A busy day. Yeah. Busy day, busy week. Yeah, on Monday I'm off to Maui. Yeah. I'm doing two on Maui, and then Tuesday I'm back to Big Island, okay. early in the morning. Uh, and the different islands have such different energies. A big island is grand scale. The, the big mighty Pele looking down. That's right. That's and the right. ocean. And then Maui's got another energy. And then, of course, Kauai. I hope I'm saying them right. Yeah. And Lanahi. That's all good. And, uh, and then after, and then, I, and then I leave on Thursday. Wait, but what's Oahu for you? What, what's the image of Oahu? Um, for me, it's all like, you know, the, the energy of the North Shore is completely different than downtown True. Honolulu. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's the moment I get here, I get off, and I come out. I know it's a cliche, but I see the palm fronds, and mm -hmm. I feel the warm trade winds. Mm -hmm. And I go down to Waikiki, or I, I just I so let people watch. So is it a watch. feminine thing? Is it a? I uh, know. I think it's a blend of everything. A blend. It's a blend of everything. And I know Honolulu is a big city now. Yes. The quite Hedge diverse. One Highway. It's like <laughs> Satan's like Alley. So I've had that experience too in all the faces. It's like the M50 in Dublin. But these things are the same all over the world. See, there's the so connection. So there's the city the thing, yeah. <laughs> and then you've got a great music scene here. Yes. And I'm off to the Bishop Museum. Good. Support your local museums. I'm off to the bishop. It's got an exhibition I on want, Easter I don't Island. I don't have that much time, but I'm glad you've mentioned mu museums because you're inspired. Some of your work is inspired by museum exhibitions. I love that idea. I love I it. I was wondering, you know, if you go to the Bishop Museum, maybe you can find something to create news stories from that. Indeed, because Rapa Nui, the exhibition's on there yes, at the moment. So yes. I'm going to go there, and then I'm going back to the ocean because it's a vahi, and I'm getting in that water. Yes, and, you're uh, surrounded by... There was a couple of people. There was a lot of people in the water yesterday. I nearly ran over a couple. The apologies. But a couple of people nearly ran over me, too. That's it's okay. like Mad Max out there. This is, you know, Hawaii. It's, uh, oh, it's great fun. <laughs> it's it's, it's great fun. I'm so loving it. Do you want to tell a little bit about um, tonight's performance? And yeah, it's uh, at the Orvis, uh, the Orvis Auditorium at the university. It's 7.30 kickoff. And I'll be telling tales from home and a couple others besides. 7.30 sharp. And thank you very much once again to the University Outreach Program. And thank you very much to Quack Talk for having me oh, on. Oh, thank really, you, really Neil. But it. give us like some little uh, words of wisdom from the Irish tales. Give us just a little something to bring us back to another world. Well, give us an image. Leave well, us with something. As I stood by the edge of the big island and I saw the waves crash in, I cast my mind to my other island, or to that other island, Ireland, separated by thousands of miles, but really the people are the very same. We are molded by our environment, we are molded by our ancestors, and we've got these little ones coming up now after us, and we're molding them. And what better way than to sit down, tell a yarn, or open a book and share a reading experience, and to enjoy this path that we're all on together. Yes. To, to look out for each other. Getting very deep here for a Saturday morning. No, that's okay, down great. to that university tonight. I'm going to be sharing many of you. And uh, enjoy storytelling and keep oral traditions alive, like Neil says. And good luck for the rest of your stay here. Wonderful stories. Mahalo. Continue. And as we'd say in Irish, Gura Mila Mahaga Thank you very, very Thank much. Thank you and enjoy.